Greetings and God bless you in the wonderful and powerful name of our living Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, it's time for another edition of As He Leads on the Uptime.Church Network. Uh, I'm very thankful to be here. Um, thankful to my brother, Greg Messina, for making this available. Thankful to the Lord Jesus Christ and everything he accomplished and continues to accomplish. What we'd like to do today is uh, talk to you a little bit about the wisdom of God. That's a huge subject, the wisdom of God. It's something that if you were to take the concordance, <clears throat> as Strong's or Young's analytical concordance, and go and look up the word wisdom, you'll see many uh, uses of the word wisdom. You'll see wisdom all throughout the Old Testament. Uh, by uh, God's word, he established the heavens and the earth. Uh, the wisdom itself is knowledge applied. As we get into this, and I, I wrote a few notes down before we get into the scriptures here. I'm just going to read these. Uh, as born again sons of God, God has given us certain enablements or powers. And I uh, want to go to John 14. And we're going to start in verse 6 and we're going to read through verse 14. Jesus saith unto him, he's speaking to Thomas, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I not been, <clears throat> have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then? Show us the Father. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. I believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that my Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye ask anything in my name, I will do it. Okay, let's go back and unpack a little bit of this here. Jesus, when Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say one of the ways. Uh, in the New Age movement that is occurring and has for many years, um, the unbridled, uh, everybody saved movement, I'll call it. That's a term I just made up. That there are many ways to God and everybody's going to go and be with him. You know, we're all children of God, uh, the brotherhood of God, uh, you know, humanity and all the humankind things that you see on television all the time. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Okay. He did not say he was one of the truths. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He not of one of the truths, but the truth and the life. We are born to live our first birth. When we're born, we're born to live and we're born again to serve. Jesus' life was one of service from the trial in the desert where he was tempted for 40 days. He resisted the devil with every word that proceeded from his mouth. He spoke God's word. You remember that? You know, the devil tempted him. If thou be the son of God, you can change these. You know, you can do this. You can, you can make bread out of a stone. You can make food. You can throw yourself from the pillar of the temple and his angels will have charge over thee. If, but he turned around and said, Thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He fired back using the sword of the spirit, the word of God. He knew who he was. The devil had him at his weakest point, if you will. It was like at the weakest point in his flesh. He relied on the strength of his father and his promises from his word. He had wisdom because he always did the father's will. That word wisdom. You know, God gave him the ability to be strong in those 
moments where, you know, we, we think, you know, we get tempted. There's things we do in our lives that are, that are sin, that are wrong. Um, we're, the word in says in Corinthians that we're never going to be tempted above what we're able to resist. But it, <clears throat> sometimes it takes the renewed mind. You have to, um, something comes along and it, it looks like it's going to be a temptation. And you think, well, you know, it's no really, not really a big deal. I'm going to go ahead and do this. And then you have a feeling that it's wrong. That's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit saying, that's your, that's your spiritual filter saying, no, that's, that's not right. You, you don't do that. Um, not even once. You, you, you know, it's, it's a walk. It's something you learn. Uh, none of us are perfect. We're going to make mistakes. Uh, none of us are faultless, but according to God's word, we're blameless before him. Um, Jesus Christ is the one that took our faults. He, he was the one that came and for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Let I me mean, just think about this for a minute before we go on. He laid down his life. He came that we might have life. He said he was the way, the truth, and the life. That much love, that much compassion, that much forgiveness. One of the things, one of the last uh, statements before uh, it was uh, recorded that he said, it is finished, the redemption of man. He said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. He forgave. He loved those people that are, had put him to death. It's beyond what we can imagine or comprehend. But he died even for those people. You know, I, I'm just thinking about this right now. I'm going like, that's that's a, that's the Lord I want to serve. Let's look at wisdom from a very well known record in First Kings. And then we're, we're going to go to 1 Kings um, chapter 2, or chapter 3. We're going to go 1 Kings chapter 3. And we're going to start in, <clears throat> in verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 14. This is Solomon. This is a really, this is really an interesting section of word here. Let me, let me do this one thing. Uh, Solomon was a leader who couldn't rule his people without the wisdom of the Lord. He was asked, what did, what did he want by the Lord? Solomon didn't ask for gold, silver, or lavish treasures. What he did ask for was wisdom to rule. And he was given rule with uh, verity and fairness. And uh, as we're going to read here, he certainly got that, and he certainly did. In verse 1 in uh, First Kings chapter 3, Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David. And until he had made an end of the building, his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about, only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord unto those days. I want to point something out but right here before we go ahead. A lot of people will read these sections and they'll say, well, what they were doing is their their uh, offerings and their sacrifices were pagan, were paganistic uh, in those times. Well, you have to realize there was no house built yet and, until Solomon built it for them to worship the Lord. Okay, just keep this in mind as we go on. So they were they were doing the right thing, but they just didn't have a place to do it. Solomon loved the Lord. It's a key, the big key. Loved the Lord. Walking in the statutes of David, his father, only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. And there's a note here in my notes in the Bollinger Bible that it was not necessarily, I mean, it was not something he was doing. It was not like going to the groves. It was not uh, uh, sacrificing uh, human beings like the, uh, the Aztecs did and like they did to Moloch in the Old Testament. Nothing like that. These were incense. These were burn incenses. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. 
a thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask what I shall give thee. I'm still waiting for that dream. <laughs> I haven't gotten that one yet. And Solomon said, thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on this throne as it is this day. That verse right there is so powerful. He's walked before thee in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart. Those things, just think about those things. If, that, if that's something that you're wondering what to do, you can learn an awful lot from the Old Testament. And Solomon saying this to the Lord, you know, you've done all these things for my father. This is, and now in verse seven, O Lord, my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father, but I am but a little child. It wasn't that he was a little boy. He was a little, he was young. He was young in wisdom. He, he did not have the understanding of his, of his father, David. And I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant a bunch of money so that I can run and buy islands in the Bermudas and things like that. No, it says, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Okay, it pleased the Lord. That's what I want to be doing is pleasing the Lord. And God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing and has not asked for thyself long life, neither has asked riches for thyself, nor has asked the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all these days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then will I lengthen thy days. Isn't that something else? He, he could have said, I want riches. I want honor. I want all this. You know, I want, he could have asked for anything. Uh, is there anything in that context of what we read that said that, that God wouldn't have given him anything he asked? No. But what he did is he wanted, he asked for wisdom. Uh, he was interested in governing correctly. Boy, could we take a lesson from this today look at how our government is i mean they, these these individuals and i'm going to leave names out these individuals think that they are right and what they're doing is is totally contrary to the truth of god's word in so in so many ways and then they claim that to be religious people or devout fill in the blanks that's all i'm going to say it's just it's this hypocrisy is what it is. Okay, now uh, I'd like to go to back to 1 Kings chapter 2. And we're going to read uh, the first four verses of 1 Kings chapter 2. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. We're going back, obviously. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. Show thyself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to work to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. That the Lord may continue his word, which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. 
You see that? Do you think that God wants any man to be a failure? No. Do you think that David was just saying this to take up space and so they could write this in the Bible? No. He was telling him this, show thyself a man, you, but you have to do this in order to really be considered a man. Walk in the ways of the Lord. Keep his statutes, his commandments, his testimonies. Be moral. Have the wisdom that I'm going to give you because that's where the wisdom comes from. The wisdom of God is the beginning of knowledge. It's just you, we have we have to look to him. But if we do that and we walk before him to doing it to the best of our ability, he's going to give us life and give it more abundantly. That's a pretty good promise right there. There's an awful lot of promises in the word. We don't have time to talk about all of them. We'd be here for months doing this. But you may prosper in all that you do. And that's not just talking about financial prosperity. That's talking about your health being better. That's talking about the uh, prosperity and um, your spiritual life. Being able to uh, be sensitive to the spirit of God when it prompts you. The Lord will prompt you to do certain things. Maybe you're going to just, uh, maybe just, he puts it on your heart to bless somebody who's, who's going in to have uh, treatments for cancer, who's, who's driving three times a week, a hundred miles back and forth. Maybe you just, the Lord, you know, they, they, they could really use a little bit of help. You know, why don't you do this for him or that for him? Whatever, you can fill in the blank. But that's the prompting of the Holy Spirit. It's not that you're doing that so that, um, hey, look how great I am. It's just that you have the ability to do that, to be a blessing. And that's what we're supposed to do. You know, we're really uh, in, in the second chapter of the book of Acts. We're not going to go there, but they had all things common. They had, they fellowship daily they broke bread they if somebody had a need they the need was filled within the body of the believers they didn't have to run out to the world and ask the world for help all the time with all the interest that's attached to it if you know what i'm talking about okay now we're going to go to proverbs we go to proverbs now chapter two proverbs thank you this is a wonderful section too you know i i I, originally, I was going to start off in Proverbs, but I kept thinking to myself, well, who's, a, who's a good example of uh, somebody who was a fellow who had a little bit of wisdom <laughs> from the ancient of days? And I thought Solomon, you know, David, his father did too, but Solomon, uh, obviously Jesus Christ, uh, the Apostle Paul, a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of wisdom in the, in the, in the men of God in the Bible, but as we look at Proverbs chapter 2, let's, uh, let's look at the first 11 verses here. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lift, liftest up thy voice for understanding. I'm talking about prayer there. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh wisdom and understanding. In verse 7, he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly, keepeth the paths of, right, of judgment, and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. When wisdom enters thine heart and judgment is pleasant to thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. Okay, the word um, in verse 7 of that uh, sound wisdom that word is tashia in the hebrew it means support help in our undertaking or our enterprises the other words in that section are chakma which is skillful 
So he wants us to be skillful. Um, you know, you talk about the skilled trades. You have to learn them. You go to trade school. You don't, when you go to trade school to become an electrician, you're not automatically stuck in a, uh, a brand new building to wire it. <laughs> you have to learn how to start from the very beginning. You, you know, you learn to have a healthy respect for electricity, believe me. You learn to do things correctly. You learn to, um, when you're working, to make sure that uh, you're doing it correctly and you're following a certain pattern so that you don't get yourself in the soup. And I can tell you stories about electricians I've known. Some of them were really close to getting electrocuted because of um, uh, carelessness of other people. Followed, they, he followed a certain thing this other guy didn't and almost, almost had a tragedy. But at the same time, you follow a certain uh, book, if you will. You follow a certain, um, you know, a handbook. And this is why we have the word of God. It's a, it's a handbook for us. It's God's heart. It's, it's the wisdom. It's knowledge applied for us so that we can live life and live it more abundantly. Um, wisdom for today, uh, we're going we're gonna to jump from uh, Proverbs, which is pretty neat. There's so many things in Proverbs. We could go on for a long time with that. What I want to do is I want to move along, and I want to go to Ephesians chapter 1. Um, the breakfast of champions, I call Ephesians. <laughs> it's great. Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 3 and 4. Uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him. He's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Remember earlier I said that we're, we're not without fault, but we're without blame. And the reason that we are without blame is because Jesus Christ took took the blame envelope and tore it up. Okay. We still have faults that we're dealing with. But as far as the the over the canvas of sin that keeps us from God, it's taken out of it was taken out of the way. It was nailed to his cross. That that separating curtain was was torn so that we could have access to the Father. This stuff is fantastic. You know, I, I wish I could do justice to the word of God when I share it. I, I, I try and I, I thank God for covering for me, but I just, I know the words in the word are powerful enough to go out there and set men and women free. That's one of the greatest things, one of the greatest privileges that we have when we're doing these programs is to represent the one true and living God and his son, our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If nothing else, it's just, it's, it's amazing. You know, I've done my testimony, testimony on here before, and it's, it's a miracle that I'm, that I've lived as many years as I have and done some of the things that I've done. And I'm just thankful for the mercy and grace of God and the forgiveness of God. Okay. Now let's go down to verses. We're still in Ephesians one. Let's go down to verses six through eight. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. There's one transliteration of that verse that says, lovely and acceptable. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us. In what? In all wisdom and prudence. Wisdom and prudence. Common sense. He's abounded toward us. He's redeemed us through his blood. The blood of Jesus Christ was the sacrifice that was acceptable to God. You know, there was Adam messed up. He needed, God needed to reconnect that broken spiritual connection. And he did it through Jesus Christ coming to the earth and being our payment in full. It's, it's just, it's, it's a pretty amazing thing. And another thing I was thinking about this morning before I came on here, I was talking to my wife. Jesus Christ is not a crutch. He did not say, I am the way, the truth, and the crutch. 
And anybody that comes to the Father has to use me as a crutch. He never said that. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be silly. I'm just, I've heard so many of these things. Or that if you become a Christian, it's because you're too weak. The word of God says, take upon me my yoke and my burden. Jesus Christ was weak. No, he wasn't. He was the strongest man that ever lived to be able to do what he did and to be able to say, not my will, but thine be done, Father. And to go to the cross, to be ridiculed and tried upon the mockery of a trial and beaten and, you know, hit by these Roman centurions. When a, Ro when a Roman soldier was made a centurion, and you can look this up in history books, a Roman centurion had to be able to roll up his fist and go up to an ox and hit this ox right between the eyes and stun it. So do you think that these were little weak, wimpy guys that were beating him? These were, these were like huge, like football player type guys that were beating him. Yet he went through that and he went through that for you and for me. That's, that's an amazing thing. You know, we, we read things about love and we gloss over them real quick and we say, He's made access to the Father, and we read it, and we think, isn't that great? But we, a lot of times, honestly, we don't go deeper in, in thinking about the amazing accomplishment of, the, of, of Jesus Christ's life, death, resurrection, and ascension. Yet, his ministry continues at the right hand of the Father. It didn't end. You know, it didn't, he, he went into the clouds and said, you know, the angels came back and said, well, you guys are on your own until he comes back. Nope. Tarry in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father comes. And you're going to have power. And you're going to walk out and do things. Read the book of Acts. They went out and they turned the world upside down. And they didn't have internet, television, radio. They just they went out and they spoke. They went in the temple and they spoke the words of truth. Wow, that's pretty amazing stuff, isn't it? Hey, we're going to uh, we're going to go to Ephesians uh Chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest or the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and the love to all, all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may be able to know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Okay, the, he's going to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That Holy Spirit, that gift that was given on the day of Pentecost, that Christ in you, the hope of glory, is that other comforter. You know, Jesus said that if I don't go away, I can't send another comforter. He uses the word another. Uh, I personally believe that Jesus was a comforter. In the Old Testament, it was the Holy Spirit being upon the prophets of old that was the comforter. Um, just to be able to know that you have an inheritance, uh, you know, in the future, but our lives in this day and time can be blessed and rich. But we can have, we can understand the eyes of our understanding. It's like two rivers. It's like two tributaries running into a great river. That we can understand what this life is about. That we can have hope. There's a lot of people out there that don't have any hope. They're at the end of their rope, if you will. They say, well, there's nothing more that I can do. And there's really no reason that I'm even here. And they, um, they give up. But I tell you right now, as I've said hundreds of times before, you need to stop. You need to give Jesus Christ a chance. Um, you need to seek the Lord. You need to pray out to him. You know, Lord, I really want to know if you're there. You don't have to do this long, drawn-out prayer. You you couldn't confess all your sins anyway, you know. And I'm 
I'm not discounting what other ministries are teaching right now. I'm just saying, you go, Heavenly Father, and I need you. You know, if you're there, show yourself real to me. And uh, Jesus Christ, I want to know you better. You know, teach me. And you know what he'll do? He'll teach you. He'll show you. He'll put you in touch with people that are that are, that are going to give you a knowledge that, hey, you know, life is worth living and I really can accomplish some things. And I do have the capacity to love people who many times are the unlovable people. Believe me, it says in the word of God that we were as we and as we were yet enemies, he saved us. You know, just think about that for a second. We're enemies of God by the our deeds. Yet he reached out and saved us anyway. That's that's an amazing God that we have that we serve. Okay, now we're going to go to Philippians chapter 2 and a couple of verses in Philippians. Okay, and this is, once again, I'm, I'm working on this part right here that we may be blameless, not faultless, keep that in mind, and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth Anything you want to hold forth, because it really doesn't matter. We're all going to heaven. No. Holding forth the word of truth. It's like holding a great feast dinner. It's like it's like a it's like an abundant feast at a table. Holding forth the word of life, that I may be able to rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. We're not laboring in vain. We're not running in vain if we're holding forth the word of truth that we can be lights in the world in this midst of this crooked and perverse nation, that we have the ability to stand on the word of God. If someone comes up to you and says, well, I don't like this program as he leads, you know, I, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to send Bob an email and say that he's, that what he, everything he's saying is wrong. You have a right to do that just as much as I have a right to speak the truth. Because I really believe there are still a lot of people out there that need the word of God, that need the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a, a, a girl many, many years ago that had the courage to speak it to me. And I'm thankful for that. You know, and it, it was just, and it had to have been spoken. It wasn't something that all of a sudden I just found myself in Burlingame, California to fellowship. No, it was something that I was asked to, and I thought, what do I have to lose? I didn't realize that God at that point was taking a lost guy and steering him back to the truth, like the prodigal or the forgiving father, saying, you know, it's time to go home, Bob. You've been out long enough. It's time to head back home. This is where you need to be. And if you have that kind of desire, I really believe that God will make a way. You know, he says in his word, he sent his son to have, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And we need to do it through him, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, in conclusion, we are going to go to Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 12 through 17. Put on, therefore, this is something we have to do as the elect of God. Elect of God. Wow, that's something else, isn't it? Holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and longsuffering, forbearing one another. And here's one that we all want to toss out, forgiving one another. I can't forgive him because he was what he did to me. Yeah, we got to forgive. If any man have a quarrel against any. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Perfectness, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Okay, that means let it umpire in your hearts is what that means. The word rules umpire. To the which ye are also called in one body, be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. 
even if you don't have a good singing voice, still sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. <laughs> and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. We need to allow the word of God to dwell in us richly in all wisdom, his wisdom. We need to be thankful. We need to let the word of God rule in our hearts. See, it's like a baseball analogy. I'm using that because I know Greg's a big baseball fan, just like I am. You have the umpire calling balls and strikes. We let the peace of God rule in our hearts. When we're in a situation that seems to be just absolutely, there's no possible way that there can be peace. We need to say, Lord, we need, to. you can ask for the peace of God to rule in your hearts. We can let it. We can ask God. You have not, it says in the word, you have not because you ask not. You say, Lord, I need peace today. He'll give you peace. I need to have understanding for what that person just did really hurt me. But I forgive them because I, because I know how much you love me. You see, it's a, it's a growth. You don't all of a sudden one day get born again to the spirit of God. And then everything is perfect. Now, we don't come on here on Tuesday nights and say that if you become a son of God and make Jesus Christ Lord in your life, that everything's going to be smooth and perfect. But I'll tell you one thing, your life is going to be enriched. You're going to find things out about yourself that you've never known. There's, there's areas in your life that you, that maybe you've had, uh, there's broken parts of your life that are going to be mended because God is the great physician. You know, uh, he'll, he'll do it. He has the ability to do that, but we need to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly in all wisdom. And that's, that's pretty much the, what I'm going to end with here. We need to allow it to dwell in us. And the only way we can really do that is by studying it and teaching it, admonishing one another. That's another key there, teaching and admonishing one another. You know, when, I, when I'm on any of the programs that I'm on, sometimes I'm on with Brother Michael Pels. Um, sometimes I'm on with uh, my dear brother JB, John Boucher. And I always learn things when I'm on with the with the uh, my brothers on Tuesday nights. I'm always learning things, uh, but we're teaching and admonishing one another. Uh, we're not on here uh, in, in a competition. You know, I don't ever consider it a competition to um, of uh, intellects. So we're coming on here and and seeing who has the better understanding of God's word. The Father has put the body together as it pleased him, and we each need each other's strengths. So I thank you, Lord, for today. I thank you for your word. I thank you for Brother Greg and, and the uptime format and blessing each and every person who will watch this. Thank you for giving them an understanding. And if they're seeking the truth, that you make a pathway to bring them back home. I thank you that this is done to your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.